how do you regulate such a thing? There was this uh, there was this call to pause the development of AI for six months while every everyone tried to figure out what to do with it. But this is not something you can regulate. I believe it is already out there. There are hundreds of companies now entering into this space. Tens of billions of dollars are being poured in. And if you stop the big companies from like, you know, Microsoft, Google, from developing, there are already <laughs> hundreds of companies out there who are not going to stop. They're going to build uh, the most exciting, um, for me, the most exciting uh, thing happening with these large language models is the open source community. Because now they have made it made made it um, available to researchers, to companies, to universities, these models for free. Okay, all you have to do is install it in your server, and you can play with it. You can create use cases with it. Welcome to the webinar on embracing diversity and inclusiveness towards ChatGPT, brought to you by UNPAD, the Asian Network of People and Organizational Development. We are fortunate today to have two highly respected, distinguished experts in their fields. And of course, I'm referring to none other than Ernesto Bugi Boydon, and also we have Dr. Vlad Mariano. In the meantime, may I present, because many of you are not familiar yet with UNPAD. So let me show you the objectives of why, over two years ago, our founders, Mr. Musharraf and Dr. Yugesh decided to organize this network. So let's take a look at the overview. Why UNPAD? Our objectives and roles, as you can see, is to attract and act as a network among varied subject matter ex experts within the Asian region to promote people and organizational development and act as a conduit and platform for easy accessibility to diverse subjects, share good business practices and experiences for the development of the community at large for greater progress. And we have regional representatives, as you can see, so we will stop here so that I can now turn over the virtual stage to our first speaker, but let me have the honor and pleasure of introducing him. Our speaker is the CEO and founder of Cyber Optimus Philippines Incorporated, also a founding board member of the Philippine Society of IT Educators. His mission is to help businesses create a roadmap for the digital transformation through a framework called the Davidic Growth Program. And here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Ernesto Boogie Boydon. Thank you. Thank you, Dina, for that warm introduction. And uh, thank you, everyone, for being here today. Uh, congratulations to the founders and board of UNPAD for successfully 
creating and initiating this webinar. Uh, I, I, if I understand it correctly, this is the first webinar that we have launched, right, Dina? Is it? Um, we had one like oh, the other yeah. year. Yeah. I see. Uh, but unfortunately, it was not followed up with another one. So, oh, so we but... are blessed by your presence here uh, as well as oh. that. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, but 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 here we are. So I, I guess this will be the start of more webinars to come. Yes. So I just like to go straight to my presentation. And what I, what I'd like to share with the audience uh, today is really about paving the way for thriving in a digital economy. I, I'm sure that a lot of people who are here right now came and uh, 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 accepted the invitation, our invitation for them to join us today because this is something that is at the back of the minds of a lot of people right now, right? They, they're, they're all thinking because of the way the technology has been accelerating lately. And later on, we will hear more about it uh, with Dr. Mariano's talk on chat GPT and AI. But I just want to set the, the tone of the discussion. I just want to set also the, or, or to present something that we should all be thinking of in spite of this acceleration of technology that's happening. And this is what about how, how do we now thrive in this digital economy? Because we are sure that in the coming months, years, and so on, we will have more of this. We will have more of technology, we will have more of uh, AI, we will more have more of this chat GPT and other generative, generative, uh, generative AIs out there. And but how do we how do we cope with that? How do we but let me start by showing you something that was uh, a result of research about uh, five years ago. And, and this is about 2018. Sorry, I forgot to share the sound. Okay. Why did I start with that? Well, 
imagine this is something that was done in 2018, five years ago. It was a survey. And I think we all know that maybe uh, around, let's say, a year after, when this was being shown to people, most of the reaction would have been, oh, that's uh, too far away. Uh, it, it won't really happen in those uh, years that you're predicting. Okay? But what happened? The pandemic happened, and then suddenly, a lot of these things happened in our midst, right? You could just imagine, maybe uh, in 2026, a board member of Unpod <laughs> would be an AI. <laughs> would you imagine that? And, and so the pandemic has accelerated a lot of things, and that is what we need to cope with right now. And so the question at the back of the minds of everyone is how do we address this digital transformation desire? Well, first, we need to understand what do we mean by digital transformation? And I'd like to offer this, okay? When you talk about digital transformation, when I talk about digital transformation, I always say that uh, it should be in the context of transformative digitalization. Now, why do I, what do I mean by that? When people hear or see the phrase digital transformation, the, the usual reaction is that they think because the, the word digital comes ahead, it's what they see first. So they immediately think that it's about computers, it's about automation, it's about you know these robots and all of this technology. When it is not primarily about it at all. Sometimes we forget the word transformation. And so I want to bring it back, and that's why I've been calling it transformative digitalization. The focus is on the transformation. We need to understand first. Where do we need to transform? Why do we need to do it? Why do we even have to have all of these computers at all so that we will be able to take charge of the transformation that is happening? And then, and then, only then, do we look at the digitalization that is happening? That is when we choose the technology, the right technology, which would address our requirements. I would like to think of it this way. It's profound, definitely. It means it's it's uh, it will be it will affect a lot of the areas of our lives, and it will transform practically everything. Okay, and not just our activities, but our processes, our competencies. But it's about harnessing the power of this technology to make lasting and sustainable impact and change on the way that we do things, on the way that we do business, even our very lives. But the key here is the last part. We should always look at it in a strategic and prioritized way. We don't do technology just for technology's sake. And there are three A's that I would suggest that people need to have in order to prepare for it. We need to be adroit. It's, you know, when we look at things, even without technology, we should be able to, to think of clever ways, resourceful ways to handle the situation. Because the technology is just an enabler it's just something to help us do it more efficiently. Now, but aside from being adroit, we need to be agile, which means that we need to act quickly. Sometimes people are able to think of grand ideas, right? Of things that they can do, but they don't get to do it at all, right? It's stuck there in their minds. We need to be agile and quick in implementing, in doing, in trying, in testing, whatever it is that we want to, to see or the change that we want to see in our lives. But at the same time, what this acceleration of technology has taught us is that we need to be adaptable, right? Nobody predicted the, the, the well, it, is, it was talked about, but nobody maybe even saw the extent of the effect of the pandemic on us. And we need to be able to uh, be willing to change in order to suit different conditions. So if something happens, and I think we were able to see that resilience in a lot of people across the globe, right? When quickly, in a matter of days, we were able to shift to new things. But it created a lot of chaos, right? Because a lot of people just experimented without having a firm structure or uh, idea what they were doing at all. And a lot of failures happened also during that time. Now, one of the things that drives all of this transformation is innovation. In other words, when we try to adapt to the new situation, we need to think, I, I used to do it this way, okay? But now, because of this situation, I cannot do it anymore this way. Or let's say in a business, 
you have been used to doing it in a certain manner. But now you have a very agile and more technology savvy competitor. And then you start thinking, I, I cannot just continue doing it the same way I've been doing it all these years because I'm losing to competition. And that's where innovation should come in. Michael Vance says that innovation is the creation of the new or the rearranging of the old in a new way. It's, it's putting in a fresh perspective to something that we have been doing so that it now gives a new flavor uh, to your audience, to your customers, to your clients. Let, let's look at this video. example of creativity and innovation at play right this thinking of or twisting or, or tweaking the way that the billboard interacts with this environment to produce a, a surprising effect right and the people in the on the platform uh, were uh, attracted to it because of this new way of presentation but i think it is also important that even before we think of innovation even before we think how do we do things uh, in a new way, the first thing that people have to develop in themselves is what I call what we call a growth mindset. This comes from a book by doc that was uh, became popular uh, in recent times. This is uh, a book by psychologist Dr. Carol Dweck, and a lot of the top CEOs all over the globe have been talking about it, have been implementing it in their own organizations, and it's the idea that we need to make ourselves think that if we look at something we and and it's a it's something that's difficult it's something that's a challenge that we don't give up but instead look at it from a fresh perspective and think that if we put our mind to it we can do it now they say that some people have a fixed mindset okay uh it's like when you're faced with a challenge and and you say, oh, I cannot do that anymore because uh, it's, it's beyond my abilities. It's beyond what I'm trained for. It's beyond my capabilities. It's beyond what I know. It's beyond what I learned, okay? And so they stop, right? And they think, uh, well, I'll just stay here, okay? And do whatever it is that I've been doing all these years because I, I, I cannot do that anymore, okay? So, but then it, it creates a lot of frustration, right? Uh, because they, they don't like to be challenged. And they think that everything is predetermined and that, you know, when, when, when challenges come up, that they just, they just have to stay with it. But Dr. Carol Dweck is saying that there, there could be a growth mindset. And a growth mindset is one where you look at challenges in a fresh perspective and see, okay, I may not know how to deal with this right now, but if I study it, if I learn about it, learn more about it, then maybe I can do something about it. But the beautiful thing about the book, and this is what also caught my attention, and this I've been using this in a lot of the things that I do now. What enamored me in what Dr. Dweck was saying is this. She said that a growth mindset can be learned. In other words, it's not a fixed demarcation line where either you're a fixed mindset or a growth mindset. No. In fact, what she says is that at some points in our lives, all of us have maybe gone through a period where we were we had a fixed mindset, right? Like we were frozen on our tracks with, with a problem and we couldn't we didn't know anymore what to do. Okay. But at some point, we may also have experienced having a growth mindset. And that's the important thing about this one. It's not fixed for people. People can be taught. People can develop it. So it can be learned. It can be taught. It can be developed. And, but it's important. It's important that people have a growth mindset if they are to 
dream up of new things to address the problems that they're facing. Let's look at this next video. Let me set it up for you. Let's say you are the CEO of a theater company in Spain and you focus on comedy theater. Every night you run comedy shows at your theaters, one morning you wake up and you realize that the government has increased the tax rate from 8% to 21%. Translation, tonight nobody's going to show up. What do you do? How do you respond to this external shock? Think about it for five seconds and then I'll show you exactly what these guys did. All right, have a look. Pay per laugh, the first comedy shows where you only pay for what you consume. We fitted each seat with a facial recognition system that detects the smile and proposed the following deal to spectators. Entrance will be totally free. If the show produces no laughs, you don't pay anything. However, if you laugh, you have to pay for each smile. Each smile produced is worth 30 euro cents, something that in this day and age is quite a reasonable price. At the end of the show, the spectator could check their laughter account before paying and even share it on social networks. And so that no one would cry for having laughed more than they could afford, the maximum amount to pay was 80 laughs for 24 euros. The average price of the ticket increased by 6 euros. The system was covered by the main national media outlets, and this produced 35% more spectators. Each paper laugh show produced 28,000 euros more ticket money than was normally taken. Currently, the system is being copied in other theatres in Spain. A mobile phone app was created as a system of payment, and the first season ticket was launched for the number of laughs not shown. Okay, again, this is an, ex an interesting case study. Uh, a theatre in Spain, okay? <coughs> Sorry, excuse. The government declared that it was raising taxes. Okay, now... Other theater, theater companies had a fixed mindset. They reacted negatively. They said, oh, nobody can afford that. Nobody will go to our shows anymore. We just better close it, close down or close shop, right? And so some of them did that. They just gave up and they closed shop. But this particular theater group was innovative enough and had a growth mindset enough to think of approaching it from a different uh, point of view, right? And so they came up with this uh, innovative way of capturing of so the the show itself was for free. Everyone can go in and and but if they were entertained, if they laughed, and it was captured by that facial recognition app, then they paid. Okay, and that's and I think it's a very uh, prime and good example of how to have a growth mindset and be innovative. Now, some other things that people need to uh, possess would be the two, the tandem of critical thinking and creative problem solving. Now, I know that maybe you've heard about this a lot of times before. You, you've heard about critical thinking. You've heard about creative problem solving, OK? But I think there's a, prop, there's, a, there's a new perspective that I would like to offer to you today. And what is this? Well, first of all, let's look at the two different parts. Okay, Creative solving is really about you know uh, looking at a problem, but trying to think of, of an, an, a novel approach to solve it, something that maybe has not been tried before, something that maybe is unorthodox. Okay? Now, one of the important qualities that we need to develop in ourselves to have that creative problem solving attitude is curiosity. We need to be always, you know, like children looking at the world and wondering, you know. Why is it like this? Why is this, this thing? Why, why is this? How does this work? Okay. How did this happen? We always have to be curious. And, you know, I've always heard this, right? Uh, even when I was small, they, they will say necessity is the mother of invention. But growing up, I've always wondered if necessity is the mother of invention, who could be the father? Okay. And I came to the conclusion that curiosity is the father of invention. Because curiosity raises questions. You ask what, how, why, etc., And then these questions lead to discoveries. And, and so curiosity inspires, but it is discovery that reveals. For example, Archimedes was tasked by the king to prove that his crown was made entirely of gold. 
so he was experimenting, trying to figure out things, you know, and he was so curious about uh, the, that accidentally he re discovered something very, uh, very useful. And that was the, the fundamental discovery of how shifts flow, the principle of buoyancy. Okay. And, and think about it, right? The, the, the way that ships now float on the seas was brought about by something totally, totally different, totally uh, separate yet. Uh, because what he was just trying to do was to, to prove that the crown was made of gold. Okay. But that led him to this important discovery. Newton was also a very curious guy. Okay, he thought, oh, how, "How how does the rain the rainbow form?" Or when he sees sunlight reflected off a lake, okay, he was thinking, "Oh, why is that happening?" Okay, and that eventually led him to discover the laws of reflection and refraction. Now, the other side of it is critical thinking. Is the analysis of available facts, evidence, observation, and arguments to form the judgment. In other words, okay, you look at something, but you don't just accept it as face value. You look at something and then you say, okay, there might be something more to it. Okay? What is it that I may not be seeing just yet? And so you look closer, you examine it, and you try to uh, disassociate yourself from the excitement of of discovery, but just, you know, look at it critically and analytically. And that would require what you call an immersive observation. Unfortunately, a lot of people are distracted, right? Uh, in recent times, we've heard a lot of these exercises on mindfulness, mindfulness, right? You know, we are being taught, you need to be uh, present in the moment. Right? You need to focus your attention on what is happening. And I realized the other day that, you know, uh, it's something that has been with us all this time. You know? It just became popular maybe just recently. But it's something that has been with us all this time. Because when I was a young boy, my mother would always call me for being absent-minded, right? That's the term, right? And I realized that that is the opposite of mindfulness, absent-mindedness. Like when, you know, we're doing something and yet our minds are somewhere else, right? Or we're thinking of a lot of other things. Like uh, you go out the house and you lock the door, but a few meters after you, you ask yourself, did I lock the door? <laughs> or something like that, right? That's because during the time that you were locking the door, your mind was somewhere else. You were thinking of a lot of other things, right? Okay. But critical thinking requires that you learn to focus, that you learn to concentrate, that you learn to be present in the moment. Let's, let's take a look at this video. This video shows a participant from a 1998 study by Daniel Simons and Daniel Levin. Watch what happens as the unsuspecting pedestrian provides directions. <laughs> the young man on the left is one of the experimenters. He has approached the white-haired man and asked for directions. Watch closely as two people carrying a door pass between them, and the first experimenter is replaced by someone else. Like many of the people in this study, the pedestrian was entirely unaware that he was talking to a different person. Approximately 50% of the people approached in this study didn't notice when the person they were talking to was replaced by someone else. So imagine 50% of people are, are like that. They didn't even realize that they were talking to uh, <clears throat> somebody else. Uh, so let's, let's, but, but I think what is important for me to stress at this point is this, okay? That uh, the two 
actually should go together. Creative thinking and critical thinking. It's because we, when we practice creative thinking, sometimes we get too excited about our discovery, about our invention, about the things that we're trying to introduce, that we lose sight of the fact that it could be something that only we appreciate. Now, this is important in business, right? And that's why this talk is about thriving in a digital economy. We need, when we, when we do business and we try to uh, introduce new products to a market, we shouldn't be like inventors who are so in love with their creation, okay? And that's the, that's the, that's the bad part, that's the negative part of creative, of being creative, right, creativity. Because you think that if people are not appreciating what it is that you've done, then you stop there, right? Okay. But what we're saying here is that creative thinking has to be tempered with critical thinking. You look at what you've done. If it doesn't resonate with your market, then you try to figure out why. You try to ask the right questions. You try to ask, what is it that will make my invention loved by my targeted audience? And so those two things should come together. Which brings me to the last part. Uh, I think I still have about a minute or so uh, of my talk, which is about the Davidic growth paradigm. It's a framework that I created uh, where, and I think it is, it is what, I'm positioning it to help businesses thrive in the digital economy. It starts by looking at six growth areas, <clears throat> okay? But note that there is one there at the bottom, right, which is culture, because I believe that it is the most important part uh, because the many problems that we are experiencing with the way that technology is being introduced, being, you know, it's, it's, it's accelerating so fast is that the rate of acceptance and user adoption is the problem. It's about the people resisting the change or failing to embrace the technology. And even if we are able to create progress in all of the other five areas, when we do not address the culture part, we will not be able to sustain the gains that we have made in the other five parts. The framework is very simple. It, it's it starts with a maturity, digital maturity assessment. We just need to find out where you are, how, where you are in your digital journey, okay? Uh, I do this by using some instruments that ask the people in the organization to answer, okay? It's based on three core business functions, marketing operations and financial administration. And then it's aligned with the six growth areas, okay? And then because of that, of that answer, aside from pointing to us where they are with, um, with a quantitative score, the way that I design the instrument is I'm able to see the risks and opportunities, okay? And because the, the paradigm is based on two very simple principles. One is, do you have an, uh, a, a strength? If you have a strength, then that is already your advantage. And if you have that advantage, Let's try to find out how to preserve that, okay? And the way to preserve that is to understand the risk, okay? And prevent the risk from happening. The other is using a growth mindset, we look at a weakness. But instead of thinking of it as a disadvantage, we turn it around into an opportunity. And so we extract all of these growth opportunities. We go through a workshop where we can identify what kind of Add initiatives we need to do with the corporation or the business or the company. Uh, I just created an acronym called THRIVE, but it's about quality. It could be about optimization of the resources. It could be about streamlining their business processes, or it could be even about the culture, right? How do you invigorate, inspire people, motivate people again? Or it could be about, you know, looking at their business model. It might not be working anymore, but at the end of it is, it's all about the customer. It's about how do you provide quality experiences to your customers okay, that exceed their expectations and make them come back uh, for more. So in a nutshell, this is how it looks like. We do the assessment, we, got a, we get a score. We also see the recent opportunities 
we process that through a workshop. We arrive at what initiatives, and then we lay it down into a roadmap that the company can follow within the next year, two, or, or three. Okay, So this is how it looks like. The way that it's processed from the growth areas, we're able to identify the growth initiative. The long term is to bring those growth areas into the growth targets. Okay, it's about optimizing everything. Governance to become governance excellence. Uh, their process should become replicable, uh, quality and measurable. Okay, the resources yeah. should be optimized and so on. Okay, and the. Overall mapping is like this, from the growth areas to the initiatives, and then the long term is the uh, growth, arriving at the growth targets down the road. Let me leave you with something to think of. Sometimes we have always been you know, taught that uh, we need to think out of the box. Think out of the box, right? Don't constrain yourself within uh, certain parameters of a particular problem. But you know, in my experience, I've seen that sometimes it may not be enough to just think out of the box. Sometimes you may have to start thinking there is, there is no box at all because that frees you up into truly being creative and being innovative in your approaches. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone for listening. Thank you very much. Uh, into a q a thank you thank you oh my gosh um we learned so much from you um boogie and this is a real treat <laughs> uh especially for people like me i'm not a techie so i i'm learning so much more <laughs> the warp speed <laughs> for me it's already like warp speed now um there is a question and i got it one from australia and the other one from Bangladesh. But the questions are so similar that I've merged it into one. So I want to put it to you directly right now. To what extent and what kind of impact will AI have on employment? Are we going to lose our jobs? Okay. That's a very question. And that's one of my favorite questions, by the way. <laughs> because right now, what I am advocating is what I call human-driven augmented intelligence. Okay, let me explain what that means. Uh, when we talk about AI, usually the term that pops up is artificial intelligence, right? Okay. Of course, through the years, some another terminology has come up. It's augmented intelligence. But augmented intelligence is really about people taking charge of AI in order to use it to extend their capabilities. Now, from my point of view, what I would like to advocate is that we focus more on augmented intelligence and not on artificial intelligence. And I'd like to think of AI more in terms of augmented intelligence okay because well for example when we use the term artificial the normal connotation is that it's something to replace like uh, an artificial arm or an artificial leg in that case it's because the original was lost right or in the case of an artificial sweetener it's used in, in with the content, it is used to connote that it's there to replace sugar. So when we come to artificial intelligence, what would that mean? Is it something that is supposed to replace our intelligence? I don't think so. And so I'd rather use the term augmented intelligence. Okay. Of course, there's a lot of debate on the two terms right now, but that, that's my position. Yes, and uh, I believe that if we are able to harness it properly, that people don't really have to, to fear about losing their jobs. It, yes, in yes. fact, with a growth mindset, they should look at it as elevating them to other jobs that merit more thinking, right? Where their skills can be um, 
put to better use. Yes. Now, um, the next question would be, um, Boogie, is this. How do we now upskill, reskill, and maybe, uh, you know, forget about uh, the old skills that they have because it doesn't apply to the, <laughs> this augmented <laughs> intelligence anymore. How do we go about upskilling, reskilling the people who don't want to lose their jobs? Okay. I think I, I gave some clues already in the presentation. The most important uh, skills moving forward would be those two that I presented, creative thinking and critical thinking. Okay, oh. and these are the things that we need to develop in our people. Uh, for the long, the, the longest time, people have been used to doing jobs that did not require any thinking at all. It was so mechanical. They just, you know, they were taught, oh, you need just to follow this procedure, this process. Okay, you do it day in, day out. That's what you do. Okay, but a robot can already do that. So why should a human still do that at all? Okay, we need to move yeah. into the next level where we figure out okay this 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 robot this ai is already doing things but can it still be improved with something yes. that i can inject into the into yes. the process okay well thank you so much and a thought just came to uh, me this could, yeah D Dina, this uh, uh, there's a one question uh, before you relieve him uh, the only one this is from Dr. Nepal Singh from uh, India. What is the difference between human thinking with growth mindset and okay. AI or chat GPT? Oh. Oh, sorry, sorry. Can, can you repeat that, sir? Dif Dr. Difference Yaris. between human thinking with growth mindset and artificial intelligence or chat GPT. Actually, he has sent on my personal window. I I am putting in a journal window. You can read, actually. This is a live question from the doctor. This is the question. What is the difference? Chat. Oh, okay. I think the difference is really in terms of our humanity. Okay. Because the AI does not have that. Okay. Yeah. What, what I mean by that is that uh, the growth, a growth mindset can extend our, our, our thinking way beyond what we have been initially taught, right? Okay. An AI uh, will only be able to expand and extend itself based on the basic parameters that it was with. Of course, there are learning algorithms. Uh, at some point, I'm sure, AI would improve to a point where the, the uh, machine can also learn, no? learn, uh, well, but I guess I, I leave that to Dr. Mariano later to, to answer more, to answer yeah. better. But I Thank think you. the difference yes, is yes. that, uh, but I think the, dif the difference is that the growth mindset is something that stretches yeah. ourselves, right? Our mind, our brains into reaching for far more than we have been designed for. An AI will always be constrained by certain parameters. Um, yeah. Yeah. AI is the product of human behavior. Yes. 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 <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, that's and very you. good. Yeah, that's yeah. a very good insight. Okay, I, I have here so many. In, if you can just look at the chat box, there are so many of our participants who are full of gratefulness and appreciation of your presentation. Please take a look and you deserve it all. You know, I've, I've seen it and it. It makes my heart sing, <laughs> you know, really. But this is the end of the questions for you as I am also about to present the next chapter of the UNPAD, all right? So thank wait, you, not, not the next speaker, but the next chapter of UNPAD slides. Yeah. The, before I call on the second speaker, I will present the the final portion of the unpad slide deck. All right, so I'm waiting for Dino to put in the last, the last portion before we call on Dr. Vlad Mariano. Well, so as mentioned, and we do have regional representatives, meaning 
for those people out there who would like to become representatives of different countries not included here, it's still open for grabs, all right? So because you see here, um, and if Dino will show here that each, for example, Bangladesh is represented by Mr. Mosharov. And uh, if Dino can just click on the slide, uh, because it will show the name. And then we have Dr. Yogesh Yupadai of India and Dr. Daram in Malaysia and Dr. Jok of Singapore. And then that's me for the Philippines and Mr. Janaka from Sri Lanka. And we also have Yvette from UAE. And of course, Vietnam is represented also here. So let's go and check very quickly what is coming up for UNPAD. Well, it's really a network body. So you can show the rest of the slides that will be just referred to as UNPAD. But this network will not be registered, uh, no legislation, but it has an internet address. It's form for the coordination, collaboration among the group of organizations in the respective region. And let's take a look at the rest. Yes, the, what is the role of the leading organizations? Each region or each LO will be free to decide on its own products and services recognized by the governing body catered for the regional network. No LO shall act or perform any activity which is seen as promoting competition among each other. We don't compete, we cooperate, all right? And there is accountability. We contribute towards the expenditure incurred by the governing body on the website. And all LOs, shall support cross-marketing of the products and services recognized by the governing body. And we have finance and administration. We do have income and this will be managed also by an administrative department from, from within and as well as mode of payment. So let's take a look. What, what products and services are, are there possibly? All right, so let's see training programs, seminars, all right, consultancy, webinars like we have now, and of course, coaching. So let's take products and services generally specialized programs and services identified for regional marketing by ANPAD shall be promoted through an LO of the respective country. Or in the case of general programs and services or those catered specifically for regions shall be promoted through affiliate organizations. So a few more, yes, and the trainer's fee and other expenses shall be determined based on type of complexity of the programs. And contact us. And we do have our regional contacts here. Later on, before we end the show, Dr. Yogesh will show us the website because there you can immediately uh, get into how to be welcomed by the community. Yes. so. The Google form is available in the website. So this is all for now. And thank you, Dino. And I will now introduce our second distinguished expert and speaker. Dr. Vlad Mariano is a graduate of Penn State University. He is with the YSEALI at Fulbright University, Vietnam, lead faculty in tech and innovation. And he will talk about the good side or the future bright side, and at the same time, possible dark side of chat GPT. The virtual stage is yours, Dr. Vlad. Okay, good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for the introduction, uh, Ms. Dina. Let me share my screen. 
Okay. So thank you for the invitation. And um, we are now in an exciting time in, uh, <laughs> in human history. Um, I've been teaching... I've been teaching AI for uh, 20 years now, and I've never seen anything like this okay, in the lab. So ChatGPT came out um, on the last day of November. So we have December, January, February, March, April, May, June, almost seven months. And now it's um, it has, create, it has uh, created a lot of uh, disruption in the future of work in the future of um, uh, education and uh, people are trying to figure out okay what does it what does it mean to be human <laughs> and um, with uh, uh, tens of billions of dollars being poured into generative AI or this um, this new um, age of AI and you have uh, hundreds of companies that are working on the next generation okay. So as much as there's there's been so much disruption with ChatGPT and all these um, other AI tools, we're still at the beginning of a new AI revolution. So um, a simple way of looking at uh, ChatGPT or what we call a large language model is that you have an input text. It can be written or spoken. And it goes through this uh, language model. And then out comes output text. It can also be written or spoken. So many of the tasks that we do now okay, are along this, uh, this input and output model. For example, if, you're, if you are an advisor, let's say a financial advisor, somebody asks you a question. That's an input text. And then you figure it out what the answer is, and then you speak or you write an output text. Okay. In school, um, uh, students have been very creative. They submit their assignment as an input text. And then the output text is the answer to, the, to their assignment to their um, quiz or exam, okay? And even teachers, the input text could be the answer or the submission of the student. And then through the large language model, the output is the grade. The output is uh, a summary of what this is, okay? So if you imagine one job or if you divide that into many, many tasks, many of those tasks are actually just like this one. You have an input text, and then at the end, you have an output text, okay? Whether you're creating a, power, a PowerPoint presentation, whether you're creating um, a new song, whether you're creating your diet, okay? Anything that with, with an input text, and an output text, that is what a language model can do. Okay. Right now, our language model is right here, but somehow they have created this very large language model like ChatGPT, uh, BARD. BARD is um, something you can try. And now there's an open source model called Falcon, okay, which is uh, free for everyone to use. So it has, it has been a um, uh, very interesting last seven months is this beginning of this AI revolution. And um, the, the most um, interesting, some of the most interesting reactions were from the academia. Okay, so the question is, do we go back to pen and paper? Okay, so if students with their homeworks and with their online assignments, can you just use ChatGPT? Then are they thinking? Are they are they still thinking? Okay, and the question. So teachers were saying, no, they're not thinking anymore. So let's go back to pen and paper. So that's what they did. 
okay so that anything you write on that piece of paper is coming from what you're actually thinking and uh, the, of course this is not sustainable anymore because we have online education and students are carrying their phones okay but this is a like a stopgap measure okay in new york the school district said okay we're going to ban chat gpt from from the from our uh, network but later on a few months later they said oh chat gpt is actually a good tutor okay it can give feedback to a student who is who has an assignment and then the student can improve his work and then at the final submission the student can submit to the teacher and it's um, pretty much polished so they say that uh, this large language model can actually help the student to to form their work okay? not just to submit it at the end to the teacher for a summative assessment so this they found and even the Khan academy says oh this is a great tutor okay it can actually explain the different things here and having a tutor is expensive right you have to pay a real flesh and blood tutor but now with an automated tutor then the student can go into that rabbit hole of understanding the material and um, it's it doesn't get tired it's um almost free and it, it it doesn't sleep okay so this is a very exciting time for us for a teacher okay for teachers who for um, hundreds and hundreds of years have this model of uh, the sage on the stage right you have the four corners of the classroom and you are the assessor you are the source of the knowledge but now you can have this um, incredible tutor okay this large language model so one thing very interesting is that the language model can generate new ideas okay so I don't really know I've been teaching AI for more than two decades but I don't really know how this happens I'm sure it's a statistical thing but incredibly when you ask for for for, for example you create um, this presentation and you ask for four ideas on how to do something and how to lose uh, five kilograms in five months it will give you some answers and some of these answers you hear for the first time okay so it's like you have this research assistant that tells you what you already know but it also tells you something you don't know so these are starting points starting ideas that can actually help you okay help you to to with your work okay so this means that when you see something for the first time okay, when you see an idea for the first time the question is is it creative is the machine creative okay by definition creativity is when it produces something new that nobody has seen or heard before so somehow see some these are sparks of creativity uh were uh were something welcome for those who are using uh, chat gpt and teachers say that oh creativity is something you need to hone in school okay uh but we're now still in the early times okay let's wait for a few months okay every week there's something new about these large language models my biggest issue with chat gpt is the truth okay if you are a teacher then you teach your students the truth right you teach them how to find the truth and you teach the students to tell the truth right so you can you get these uh, these uh, pieces of truth from different places you check the sources and then you mash them into an idea and that's what we do as teachers right so if everyone told the truth the world will be a much better place the problem with chat gpt is that uh, many times it's not telling the truth it hallucinates 
Okay, it's like you have a research assistant who is high on drugs, right? High on cocaine, and it starts to hallucinate. It says something that is not true. Okay, it's plausible. It's plausible, perfect grammar, perfect choice of words, but it's clearly not the truth. So one thing you can been think about, you know, a large language model, it's like you're hiring an assistant, okay, a new employee into your organization. Normally, when you when you hire an employee, you always expect that employee to tell the truth, right? But with ChatGPT, it's it's very intelligent, very eloquent, very confident with what it is saying, but it does not always tell the truth. And that can be a problem. Okay. That that is a problem. Okay. So we had this um speaker before, um, Dr. Rao Kambampati. Um he spoke to our fellows on ChatGPT, and th there's this big question of the truth. Okay, so before we tell our students that when, when you Google something, when you see something on the internet, always check if it is true. Okay, but now with with these large language models, when it tr starts to hallucinate, when it starts to present stuff to us, oh my goodness. Okay. It's um, it's like it's very eloquent, confident, but it's telling us plenty of lies. Okay, that's a big, big problem. If everyone told the truth, the world would be a much better place, and everybody includes AI. <laughs> One question, another question is: Does ChatGPT deserve credit? Okay. Does it deserve credit for something that a person has written? Okay. <clears throat> so this article came up in Scientific American. And so it says, we asked ChatGPT to write, we asked GPT to write an academic paper about itself. Then we tried to get it published. Okay. So can you put ChatGPT as an author? Okay. Okay. So some in there were some journal articles that put ChatGPT as a co-author. Okay, I don't know if that is a stunt or is that a, is that a, something there with well, good intentions. But the problem with a co-author is that it cannot an AI that is that is a co-author cannot be responsible or accountable for what it wrote. Okay, only a person with flesh and blood can be account can be held accountable for what it wrote. Okay. So that's the that's the issue with academic papers. And there's also so now this so now it's it is creating a revolution in academic publishing. You know, if 60% of the paper is written by ChatGPT, then what as a reviewer what do you do about it okay um i don't know okay if you are a reviewer for a conference or a journal or a journal then you have to think about that okay that these submissions could mostly be coming from language models okay um but language models can also be useful to check for grammar to check for choice of words to paraphrase something or to come up with new ideas. But this is now creating a revolution. And to tell you frankly, I don't know the answer. What's going to happen with academic publishing? Okay, so a lot of scientists. This is January of this year. So when ChatGPT was listed as an author in research papers, scientists says, no, no, you cannot do that. AI cannot be responsible, cannot be accountable for what it wrote. Okay, you cannot say, okay, you cannot uh, uh, pinpoint AI because AI is not a person that can be accountable for something. Okay, 
there's this uh, funny story that uh, this Russian student was allowed to keep his diploma for ChatGPT written thesis. Okay, so think about your think about your students. Think about your uh, even your child. Okay, if you have a kid who is uh, who is in college, okay, maybe chances are it's been using these large language models to write much of what um, what is going to be submitted okay but there's one question is okay so college students it's okay but how about uh, very young kids for example grade one or grade two when they are still learning how to to form sentences how to choose words how to write uh ideas come how to form ideas and write them in essays please do you allow them to to use large language models okay that's a big uh, debate right now i am a computer scientist by uh, by profession and um, this large language model is now creating a revolution in how software is being created so this is a new this is a um, a relatively new tool github copilot and it so just like chat gpt you give an input a question okay or you say i want a program that does something and then the output is the program itself okay and so this is uh, now creating um very interesting uh, consequences in the software industry that you know, you can be twice productive, okay, because of uh, twice or three times or five times productive by using this, okay. So the question is with entry level programmers or entry level software developers, okay, they have to keep up and they have to learn this tool. Otherwise, it's easy to to for them to lose their job because much of the task they are doing can now be done by large language models, such as uh, GitHub Copilot. There is this uh, study, okay? And uh, I think this is, uh, this is something everyone should read. There was a question earlier is, are we going to lose our jobs? Who is going to lose their jobs? And by, by the time that your boss is going to renew you, Okay, if half of your task can now be automated, okay, what does it mean for your salary? Okay, so these are <laughs> things that you have to figure it out. <clears throat> but I'd like you to invite, I'd like to invite you to to read this paper, very interesting paper, of what jobs out there are going to be really really disrupted. Okay. So you think of financial analysts, you think about advisors, uh, you know, those who advise about diet, about, you know, all kinds of things, okay? Teachers, you have, uh, you know, anyone who has this task of an input text, and then you have the output text written or spoken. You have to really look at what that job will look like in the next few months with this large language models okay so my general impression so i'm going to okay my talk is about to end my general impression is that everyone has to use this okay because it's going to multiply your um your abilities it's going to to multiply your productivity okay so those who those who can learn this who can if who can effectively use these tools are those who are going to survive in the coming um, disruption of the labor market those who are not going to use this um beware that <laughs> there's going to be a big uh, a big uh, uh, risk to your job maybe to your salary so this is um this is something to look at okay 
So thank you very much for inviting me and it's, it's better to have uh, some question and answer. Okay, but uh, yeah, so this is the, <coughs> this is what the large language model is doing. Yes. And thank you so much, Dr. Vlad, for sharing us all of this uh, that you have learned over time. But I do notice that you mentioned it started only seven months ago, right? And how rapidly it is developing and even more and more and more. And that's why I notice also even governments, uh, the big power, superpowers are already having to uh, discuss it with scientists and all the business, uh, the entrepreneurs and how it's going to affect them because now they want to regulate it. So. Uh, the question to you would be, how are you ever to regulate something that is constantly <laughs> developing? How do you regulate such a thing? There was this uh, there was this call to pause the development of AI for six months while every everyone tried to figure out what to do with it. But this is not something you can regulate. I believe it is already out there. There are hundreds of companies now entering into this space. Tens of billions of dollars are being poured in. And if you stop the big companies from like, you know, Microsoft, Google from developing, there are already <laughs> hundreds of companies out there who are not going to stop. They're going to build uh, the most exciting, um, for me, the most exciting uh, thing happening with these large language models is the open source community because now they have made it made made it um, available to researchers to companies to universities these models for free okay all you have to do is install it in your server and you can play with it you can create use cases with it so um I don't know what's not going to happen. Okay, all of us are trying to figure out what's what's going to happen with us. Okay, this is not cute anymore. Okay, when people lose their jobs, okay, there are there are now documented cases of copyright writers suddenly they lose their jobs, or some people half of their job is automated. Like, oh my God, what are this is happening right now? Okay. I think for us, the best way is to just use it. Use this chat GPT, use Bard, Falcon, and uh, have an open discussion in our organizations, in our communities of what do we do, okay? How do we adapt and how do we effectively use these new tools? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. And we are so happy that you... Give us your time, <laughs> your precious time uh, with Maybe. us. Yes. And yes. so it's now time for us to hear from Dr. Hey, Dr. Dr. Just, just a minute, just a minute. No, we have question, two, three questions in the chat box. Oh, okay. They, so, because still we have time. So one question actually, uh, Paul Angelo Lajo. Yeah. About, one is answered by Mr. Boogie online. What I know about the job that would be lost, we talk about how we can learn the new skill, which is an excellent point. The main concern is the number of jobs that will become redundant. How can all the te te technology that will replace job account for this? Long question. <laughs> um. Yeah, thank you for the answer also, the question and the answer. but. I think we have to look at our humanity, you know. I am I am a teacher. I've been teaching for for more than two decades now. And some of the mundane tasks like checking, creating exams, creating quizzes, and um, some assessment, some many of them can now be automated by large language models like ChatGPT. But what about the human task, you know, our connection with our students? AI does not have a heart, okay? That's we have a heart, we have a soul, we have a way of connecting with our students that cannot be replaced, okay? In the next 100 years, cannot be, I don't think it's gonna be, it's replaceable by 
by any AI. Okay, so this is what we need to concentrate on, on what humans can do. Okay, well, thank you that we have this, uh, many of our mundane tasks, you know, like creating exams, checking, you know, all these uh, textual things. But, you know, our heart, our connection with our students, our ability to mentor them, to father, to, to become a father or a mother, like a second second parent, is something that we can we can do okay and it is it is uh, something we we can focus on okay as a teacher okay. see there, there's one more question but you have answered i think dr nepal singh's question as whether chat gpt can create new content i think it can't create yeah, yeah. yeah it is answer uh, mr bogi no, no, any new, no. new new perception on the question yeah yeah or, yeah well Okay, I, I want to answer that question about the thing about losing jobs and how do we replace them. Okay, I think we can get a clue from the pandemic. Remember, in the pandemic, when the pandemic started, when the pandemic happened, a lot of people were displaced. Like right? there were jobs that were lost. There were jobs that could not be done anymore. Right? But how did people survive? Okay. It, it depends on us, right? It depends on us. We cannot put our lives at the mercy of of these machines. We we need to look out for ourselves also. Like for example. Uh, when there was no transportation, there were a lot of maybe drivers who were who went out of job, right? But we know that a lot of them uh, somehow survived by finding new ways to generate revenue, generate income. And I think that's what's important, that, that perspective of, of finding a way, which as humans, I think we can always do. It, it depends on us. Uh, of course, sometimes some people will just give up and that's where your growth mindset comes in thank you thank you so much there are many questions many appreciation why would ai be seen superior because it lacks bias as a teacher <laughs> so like that what what are the current liabilities of chat gpt bird ai and other llms if there would be any will the workforce be able to cope with the uh, with that limitations. All right, Dr. Yogesh, yes. it's, time, it's time for your presentation. Yes, um, yes. So I, I, I will uh, thank again both the uh, speakers for making it convenient to be present here, presenting yeah. and answering this. So I have few yeah. uh, few things to for the participants how yeah. to join this organization and be a part of activity. Yeah. So, but I, first, I, I, I just... let me thank first of all our esteemed experts who have really given so much of their time to this. So, uh, Mr. Boogie Boydon and Dr. Vlad Bariano, we really are so grateful for your time here with us and sharing of your knowledge. And we are about to, oh, yeah, let me just mention that we are joined by. Participants from Australia, Bangladesh, I, India. I will share. I will share. Oh, you will share that. Okay. Okay. And therefore, let me give a short intro of Dr. Yogesh. He's the president of the Federation of International Trainers and Speakers, fellow and past president of India Society of Training and Development, director of Otakrasta Management Consultant. So, Virtual stage is yours, Dr. Yogesh. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, it, it gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all to this Sanford platform. We, uh, Ms. Lina, Lina has already explained because we have around 4.75 billion people in Asia, uh, around 60% of world population. And very happy to share that we have registration and joined also because Prakash Giri I just here shared one week from Nepal. We have from uh, countries representing Australia, Bangladesh, India, Malaysia, Philippines, Nepal, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, uh, United Arab Emirates, Papua New Guinea, and, and Vietnam, and so on. So it is a small number, but large representation of uh, this thing. NPOD is basically formed with a view to give to bring professionals from biggest subcontinent together on a single platform and give this platform to gain and share their knowledge and network also. 
our website i will share uh, my website also uh, www.npod.org and i am also sharing the link for joining uh, the npod how you can join it is already shared in the chat box you all will receive the same link in your email box inbox also we would like to organize regular program in future too hence request all of you to share details of resource person if you know anybody and also your own details if you would like to be one of the resource person for our ensuing program do join us for the future program also big thank you all of to all of you for joining this afternoon i will share the see this is our website it is also under construction and these are the lena ji has already shared these are the member country we have member organization represented by different uh, mr musharraf who has been present who is present president very eminent professional from bangladesh myself dr dharam from malaysia ms dina you have seen her janaka kumar singh from uh, um, sri lanka madam ho from singapore and vietnam and so on we have got uh, blog also news and events you can contact us on the website also and do, you can join through website also so uh, these are the uh, few things from our side see let's be together for putting our profession in the next orbit of growth today it was on chat uh, chat gpt or ai we are going to have very shortly another webinar of this type of webinar do join us recommend you send uh, the link for joining to other professional in your network who could not be part of this program thank you very much god bless all of us all the best do take care of your good health thank you so much dina ji over to you uh we want to thank all the participants who devoted also their time with us and this is a saturday as you know this is when people go out and relax but however i really find this very stimulating you know it was also relaxing for me because i i was so relaxed because i learned more because it's not nice not to know what's happening i i like it so let me ask uh, you know from from my very good friend from zonta international let me ask uh, attorney chito chavez please for your instant feedback please yeah uh, thank you very much for for asking actually during the entire webinar on this chat gpt my concern as a part of the academe i'm actually also with the academe and my concern all the time especially that we are doing exams via you know online exams and i you know my my, my usual worry is uh, how can you prevent this especially if this is available online how can you prevent the students from you know relying on this information and then being able to to get 100% in their exams because they they, they are they have it in, you know in, in their in, in their on their computers while they're taking my exam maybe they can access this and can come up with 100% result because of the availability of this information so this is what has been bothering me earlier and also is that not going to also you know somehow encourage or people to be i mean the students because before we would go to the library and research and and somehow when you do that it you you know you're able to remember those things well like when i took the bar exams i i recorded everything and and even when i i was sleeping i would turn it on and all these things and and that made me made me retain everything that i took when 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 i i, I took the bar exams then you know it was a stock knowledge but when these are readily available i don't think people will be able to remember it as much as i i, I did so is this this not actually encouraging people to be lazy well in a manner of speaking actually it's like this uh chito you know what i think about this it, it it's life it's like there is a good and the bad side there is the 
lightness and the darkness. We have to take both, you know, because you cannot have it one way or the other. So for me, if I were the student, I will only use chat GPT for certain things that are so repetitive and I don't want to keep on repeating it. So I would only use that. But for the times when I really want to challenge my brain, I'll do it myself. <laughs> I, I don't want to use that G GPT because I want to also hone my brain to think, <laughs> to really think for myself. So it, the challenge really, Chito, is more of, it depends on the individual. Yeah. Because you, you can be lazy. You, you know what? Uh, this is what we call tendencies. Some people may really tend to be lazy, while others tend to be more hardworking. So this, this probably would be very favorite pastime for most of people who don't want to take too much time doing repetitive tasks, <laughs> right? Yeah, but uh, actually it's already being studied uh, all over the world, but there's no stopping it. I, I don't think so. It's, it's already started, right? So it's up to the, for example, you in your academe, you know what I'll do if I were the teacher? I will ask the students, I, I will not rely on the rhythm or something that they just submit, I will ask for to meet them one-on-one -on -one because if I ask them directly, they don't have chat GPT in front of them. Then they have to give the answer. Then that's how we'll, I will know. Oh, you're, you know, or you don't know. <laughs> you know, that's how I will catch my students. Yeah. 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 But, uh, any, anybody else would like to give any feedback? They, they can just unmute themselves one by one. Yeah. Five minutes. Yeah. Take. yeah. Thank you. Thank you again, Tito. Uh, at any rate, I mean, I was just sharing what I thought that. Prakash, you would like to say Prakash from Nepal? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so thank much you. for this opportunity, Dr. Yogesh. So, like, I'm very honored to be with you today, all the teams. So, I'm blessed to hear you and to explore more. So, I mostly be online and I work on ChatGPT. And ChatGPT has become a part of my <laughs> life. And I need to be keeping the integrity, academy, honesty, and discipline. So as a researcher and a scholar from Nepal, so Yogas has been a blessing for me to explore more. Thank you so much. Kudos to you Thank all. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Anybody else from Bangladesh? Because a lot of people from Philippines, Bangladesh. I will require Dr. Nepal Singh from India. To say only, only 30 second, 40 second feedback. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, please. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Yogesh. Uh, and uh, I it, go on the it to what teamwork, it is teamwork. Yes. Yes. Go ahead, it's please. a wonderful presentation on the both uh, topics. And the chat GPT, no doubt, is going to be worked uh, in days to come. And earlier presentation was also very relevant on AI, and both are the challenging to the being the human thinking mind mindset, and uh, a good insightful figure. And thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you, thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Anybody else? We have many many professionals from Bangladesh. Raju Giriji, Ms. Taslima. Yes, please. Yes, go ahead, Greetings to all. Yes, say a few words about the program, your feedback in 30 seconds. So I joined very uh, lately. I delayed to join here. Uh, thank you very much to my Banja podcast, Sandra from Pohara. He gave me the link and I could join with you. It's my first time and I hope I'll enjoy the uh, days to come. Thank you, thank you. Yes, Mr. Mohammad Hassan. Hi, everybody. Uh, I am Hassan Al Mamun from Bangladesh. Yes, go ahead. Please. Actually, I would like to give a thank you uh, for I nice presentation. Spotlight because your video is not on, so. Yeah. <laughs> I am in at home. 
and okay. uh, very casual so i am uh, beg my pardon uh, actually uh, i will give thanks uh, this organization uh, to uh, organize such a nice presentation a nice session and uh, uh, we are the uh, i am the uh, publicity secretary of ipm bangladesh the ipm oh, great, is the one of you. the biggest uh, and largest and oldest hr professional bangladesh uh, uh, professional uh, hr professional organization bangladesh and i am happily to inform you that uh, mr mosharraf hussain sir hr guru oh. of bangladesh is the president of the uh, ipm yeah, bangladesh he, he is inspiration to I, I in him. india also yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, you Mosharraf sir, to give uh, uh, share. Uh, Paul the news. Angelo, we would like Paul Angelo, who has been very active on the chat. So actually, there's no award otherwise. I would have announced. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, Mr. Yeah, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for your information, that uh, <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, in the IPM <laughs> banner, yeah, we already uh, we already organized a uh, uh, CPD on the uh, chat GPT and AI. And thank that was you, a very successful you. session. So thank, thank you, you everybody. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Paul. Uh, maybe not a question, more of a, a wish, I could say, for Ampog. You know, we spend a lot of time talking about what technology can do for us. And I have nothing against that. But we should spend more time speaking or talking about discussing what technology is doing to us. Okay, the point raised by, I believe it was Chito about how she did her thesis the old way, and pretty much I did it also that. Our brains are naturally lazy. They are, they'll always find the shortest way. So when you put something like chat GPT in front of our brains, it's not gonna help our brains at all. <laughs> just cause it to cheat and take shortcuts. But uh, just, we can't stop it. So I think we should, spend more time talking about what all this technology is doing actually to us. Thank you so much. Otherwise, uh, I, I, would like, I would like all people who can switch on their video, I would like to click one and a collage for all of us. Who can put on their video, please? It is not compulsory, but whosoever can put on. And then we have uh, Ms. Dr. Dharam from Malaysia and Mr. Musarraf. So I, I, I give me a few minutes because I have to take three class <laughs> and I have to save it also. One is clear. Okay. This this there's no one. If I may respond briefly uh to what Paul said. Yes, uh, yes, please. I concur with his concern because this was something raised by one of the experts that we had on our show, um, Colin Blackwell, who also hails from Vietnam, who, who, who talked about how AI can be seen as, as a partner, uh, you know, like augmented intelligence rather than just purely artificial. And that he, he posits that the role people will have moving forward will be more as visionaries where we will be able to reimagine our jobs and what we can do in terms of our productivity when we have it as a partner or as a, a tool. So he, he, he feels we shouldn't fear it as much as we need to embrace it. Uh, finally, uh, HR questions will, will simply change. It will no longer be. So what degree did you finish in school? Uh, what's been your experience about this job? It'll, it'll become, uh, what AI tools have you learned to use and how has it improved your productivity? You know, HR questions will in the future be more like that rather than the 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 old way so uh like paul i i worry about um what it's doing to us but it's in its infancy and so things can can go either way depending on on how we use it um so back to you please doctor thank you thank you so much uh Thank you so much. And over to Ms. Dina. I think we are we are crossing time. Ah, Mr. Dharan, would you like to say anything? He's our board member from Malaysia. And uh, Mr. Not Musarraf. for the moment. 